You were there for me when I was in need of you. You gave me reason to live my life with much hope. You were so kind and pure. You taught me well these days. I was so. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون ولا جنبا إلا عابر سبيل حتى Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen We'll be proceeding from where we stopped yesterday And that is verse number 43 of Surah An-Nisa Surah 4 verse 43 We have attempted dealing with the first part of the verse Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying Calling the believers لا تقرب الصلاة وأنتم سكارا Do not come near salah when you are drunk We had indicated that that verse reflects a state A situation, a stage in the stages of revelation of the glorious Quran When alcoholism or consumption of intoxicants had not been expressly prohibited by Allah Azza wa Jalla. We had also informed us how the Quran in its uh, 23 years of revelation had uh, taken a gradual approach in moving people from where they used to be to the best state of Iman where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the Ummah. And uh, we also commented on what could have been the rationale behind Allah saying, do not come near Salah when you are drunk. We had raised the two propositions. One, that intoxicant as it were is Najasa. And that is looking at the family of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put together. Uh, intoxicant is one, one thing. And then in the same context, we also have Allah speaking about conditions that may deprive a believer of the requisite state of purity, which will make him qualify to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it is on that basis that some had suggested that um, intoxicant is an impure substance which will definitely require a purification. But that has also been responded to. That the emphasis here is on the state of drunkenness. 
not necessarily uh, tasting or consuming the substance per se as at this time of revelation and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is most clear hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun because that is the condition do not come near salah in that state until you know what you are saying so that means that salah is prohibited in the state of drunkenness because that state impairs the alertness of the mind consciousness of the worshiper which indeed is a condition precedent to validity of salah to be drunk is to suffer from temporary insanity and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires perfect sanity for valid salah now we we also discussed that uh, the main the rationale behind the prohibition of salah in that state is simply because a drunk person is not too conscious not too alert and in that case he has lost one of the conditions precedent to validity of salah every all the fuqaha are unanimous on the fact that part of the shurut that will make salah obligatory on a believer is that he should be aqil and bali he must be seen he must also have attained the age of responsibility and we also say by extension any other feature any other quality that will also have the same effect of depriving a worshiper the alertness of his mind for the time being will also not make him qualify for observing salah until he has gained full consciousness of his mind are we together and that's why we went quickly to the hadith of the prophet وسلم, advising a person who is sleep praying if i may use that word you know that kind of isha that you observe between 10 and 11 o'clock after a hectic traffic you are yawning at the same time while reciting fatia something like that especially in congregational prayer the prophet has said whoever is dozing in his salah let him find a proper bed and have a sound sleep then he should pray afterwards a, a dozing person that is sleeping while praying may not even know whether he has uh, recited surah al fatiha correctly or not whether he has even recited another surah in the place of uh, fatiha or not so there is no how such person can ascertain the validity of the salah therefore we should also and we also spoke about somebody who is sick and is suffering from maybe a condition like someone having high fever who may also be impaired for the time being i mean in terms of his intellect or his mind such persons are exempted from salah even if they appear physically wrong but once you can notice that they are not coordinated from what what the utterances they are making which is an indication of uh, not being too stable in their mind you leave them until they know exactly what they are saying that has been taken before we proceed on this salah here is it even salah or kinaya or uh, uh, the word salah in do not approach how is it translated in our translation is it salah or worship do not come near prayer do we have another suggestion i expect someone to say something that is different from prayer any other options in our translation uh, no other one well we will see from the second part of the verse that the word prayer there may not even necessarily be prayer but it may be place of prayer because if allah says la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara then wala junuban illa abiri sabi and then so also should a junub. We had explained what who is a junub. 
someone in a state of uh, ceremonial impurity should also not approach salat are we there but allah says except if you are a passerby is salat a passage or a road are we together here yeah? so also should a person in the state of janaba not also come near salah except if you are only to pass by salah as a corridor or as a pathway Is, does that sound logical so that also gives a suggestion which is also perfect that la taqrabu salata means do not approach the houses of worship don't even come to the masjid once you are drunk are we together because you can constitute some new sense the odor of what you have consumed may be one minor nuisance your misconduct as well in that state sorry i don't think i have to use an addressee speech here because there is nobody here who is still at that level it's my expectation that nobody in this audience should still be at this very lowly level of islam and may allah not cause us to degenerate after he has adorned us with a substantial faith and substantial submission to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but but for the purpose of explaining the words of allah la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara will mean do not come near the assembly of prayer are we there do not come near the assembly of worship don't come near the masjid until you know what you are saying and that is because you can speak insult someone unnecessarily and that may also lead to an issue crisis whatever in the course of salah and then that is not going to be too good enough so if we now agree that salat here is a word used can i say interchangeably with what with what masjid then it's going to be logical to say wala junuban illa abiri sabil and you should not also come to the masjid as a junub unless you are a passerby who must have to pass through the masjid to get to his destination so you can enter the masjid pick something there come out pass through the masjid to wherever you are going but a junub may not also qualify to have a uh, uh, a station in the house of allah you can be seated in the masjid unless you have done the requisite a purification that of course may also be for reasons that are very obvious even beyond whatever spiritual reason that we may infer from the text of the quran another thing we also have to quickly look at is who is a juno and we had said that the word juno means somebody who is in the state of janaba and that there are several circumstances that can bring one into that state the one that we all know is even mentioned specifically in the passage and maybe we should uh, drop that one becomes a junub not necessarily by engaging in real conjugal activity in the act of mating but also some other conditions too can bring one into that state conditions that are different from that but which will impact on the worshiper the same feeling the same circumstance that will be the result of the actual act of mating are we together so masturbation regardless of uh, whatever the opposition we may want to take on that i think we may also have to note that majority of the jurists of islam are of the view 
that that is haram and it's only only also constitutes some quasi act of infidelity and they are proof for that this is a digression but i think it's a good opportunity to address that before we move on and their proof for that is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns all acts of uh transgression in terms of the modesty of a believer all acts of injustity is condemned by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the only exemption to that is illa ala azwajihim awma malakat aymanuhum except of course if a manhood or womanhood has been engaged with respect to only our spouses then that is the only exception and the quran further goes on to say famani butaga wara adhalika fa ulaika humul adun whoever expresses his masculinity if i may coin that word or femininity other than outside the confines of wedlock seeking other option that is different from his spouse whichever option then such are deemed to be transgressors some juries have held on to that if it is not human and human if it is not the real thing any other option will also amount to haram why because allah says illa ala azwajihim except of course with your lawful spouse awma malakat aymanuhum or whatever your right hand may possess when we can still validly have a slavery around when human beings used to be held as properties before islam began a gradual process also of complete abolition of a uh, uh, slavery uh, except of course in some exceptional circumstances that may still endure then allah concludes pamani bitaka wara adali whoever seeks any option other than gratification with a human partner within lawful matrimony has indeed transgressed the limit so they said seeking an option in masturbation as well will also be one of such options that is outside the matrimony but imam ahmad bin hanbal rahimahullah has a lone voice here has been the only person who has said that well i mean among the four imams not the only imam but among the four leading imams we might also have other great scholars of uh, equal or uh, uh, who might have also said the same thing as permitted that as a way out from a condition of uh, necessity uh, given instances where man may either explore that or become unnecessarily aggressive and then transgress the limit by even doing something that is more major so that if that will calm down his nerves and uh, will also put him or his urge under some check or control then it may be allowed if one has found out that the stage where i am now is either i just do something nasty or i just calm down myself with this but you know no matter how aggressive especially going by the nature of a man once you have reached that climax whatever is wrong with you will always calm down so imam ahmad bin hanbal as uh, regarded this as permissible in condition of extreme necessity so what what led us to here is that if one has indulged himself through some lustful thought by which has led him to substantial arousal and uh, as a result of which he attained a climax in that regard he is also a juno except a person who can simply notice some discharge in him without any connection at all to any feeling of arousal that is a different stage 
even if it's just thought, even if it's just imagination, or some funny thing that has also led to a man having the same feeling that he would ordinarily have if he were to have engaged in the act, really, he also becomes what? A Junob. And then we said as well that it can as well happen even in an unconscious state. But I just want to note that uh, some may have expressed a different opinion uh, that um, uh, one who has had a wet dream may not, uh, uh, that that is the only situation that the Hadith has spoken about. Some have said that. And that any other situation other than that, there is no text on it. Those who are saying that are not applying an important source of Islamic law, which is what? Qiyas. That whatever looks alike should all, what the two things that look alike should always be treated alike. There may be no uh, hadith specifically on masturbation, as I have said, but there are uh, enough uh, uh, hadith uh, on other things which we may compare and then come to that conclusion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom as well has also spoken generally of a state of janaba without necessarily saying what may lead to that. That also opens a window that one can come to that state not necessarily through the main thing. We mentioned too that our mother Umm Salama radiallahu anha asked the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if the same thing happens to a woman, if a woman also has a dream, would she also have to observe Janaba? And the answer of the Prophet sallallahu was, Naam idha ra'atil ma. Yes, she will once she has been able to see or observe the fluid. And that will be left for the women folk to determine what fluid is applicable to that circumstance. Once we can see that secretion that is connected with that feeling, if it has happened in the real sense, if it now happens through a dream that we had, or certain imaginations or certain feelings that we had, and we got ourselves to that stage, then Janaba will also be uh, compulsory. We distinguished, however, between some secretions. In this respect, I can only speak of the male. I may not be able to uh, be too authoritative about, uh, I may not be in a position to make a distinction between um, uh, a level of arousal in female and another. The women themselves will determine that. But as far as men are concerned, the, we can visibly distinguish between certain uh, secretions in men that are also indicate arousal but is not the major one. We quoted the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu who indicated that he was a very manly man, young man in his uh, youthful age as a result of which he was fond of uh, discharging what is called prostate fluid and he needed to know whether he had to observe Janaba on account of that or not. He sent someone to ask the question from the Prophet وسلم, because according to him, he was shy to ask the Prophet وسلم, of a subject of such nature. The person asked, and the answer of the Prophet وسلم, is that was that he should just treat that simply as a urine. I mean, cleaning up the way you would clean up having urinated, and then he should observe wudu. That means no matter the level of of arousal if it has not gone beyond the prostate fluid then what is needed to be done is what cleaning up and then observing wudu guslu i mean ritual bath is not compulsory at that stage if one is in the state of Janaba, he cannot come to the assembly of worship, he cannot be in the house of Allah, except he is just merely passing through. I will um, delay the main one until the very point, inshallah. Can we read on? 
illa abri sabilin hatta taqtasilu hatta taqtasilu implies that whatever the cause of the state of janaba whether the major one or some other ones that are different from the real one once one is in that state then nothing can make one qualify for observing salah except what ghuslu hatta taqtasilu until you have observed the ritual part so when we discuss the second part inshallah then we may briefly also inform ourselves how to do that uh, practically speaking or maybe we should just okay let's quickly go through wa in kuntum marda wa in kuntum marda aw ala safar aw jaa ahad minkum aw jaa ahad minkum min al let me quickly take the part Aula Mastumun Nisa. We are coming to Wa Inkuntum Mordo. We are going now to Aula Mastumun Nisa so that we can treat that along with La Takrabu Salata, La Takrabu Salata, Wa Antum Sukara, Wa La Junuban. إلا عابري سبيل حتى تقتسلوا. Another state that can condition that will also warrant Janaba compulsorily is Aula Mastumun Nisa. Is also when you have had cause to touch your spouses. The verse is addressed to the men, but it is also reversible. So the same thing also applies because that is something that involves mutual involvement of the two spouses. Aula mastumun nisa. When you have cause to touch women, but we know verily that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply being modest. To all mature minds here, I think we also have a lesson to learn here in passing. Allah the omnipotent, the Lord, Lord the sovereign Lord, 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 Lord who can, who can never, never be questioned, be questioned should, should be, be the person, the person who, who should have the absolute freedom, 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 freedom to express, express anything, anything without, without any regard, any regard at, all at all for, for uh, decency. But the Prophet but the Allah 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 also said, Inna Allah, hajiyun. Allah our Lord is also a shy God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kanna al jima'a billams commenting on this uh, verse of the glorious Quran. That the message the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa describing Allah as a shy God. Are we there? Are we there? Allah our Lord is what? Shy. To have a sense of shyness shows a high level of decency. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh coined the word, the word touch, touch for what, for what we, we also, also know, know to be, to be intercourse. intercourse there could have been a more blunt, blunt way, way of putting of this expression. expression but because that may not be consistent with decency allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also giving us a a model here which all of us should adopt whenever we speak Whenever we talk, even whenever we write, we should always adopt the most decent of expression. If Allah can observe this, then nobody should have the license or authority to just make expressions that are vulgar, that are completely devoid of decency. All mature men and women here know what we mean by or when you have also touched your women. Women, huh? 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 Touching, Touching in this circumstance means mean the real act. act. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commenting on that says, Iza jalasa ala shu'abiha al-arba'a al-arba'a wajahadaha faqad wajaba al-ghuslu. And in another riwayah we have the addition, anzala am lam yunzil. Once 
the two genitals have met and the man has also achieved substantial uh, penetration so that one has substantially disappeared into the other guslu has become compulsory the two of them must observe the ritual bar anzala amlam yunzil whether the man has been able to reach his destination or he has not been able once the two have met then guslu is compulsory i think by that we should have uh, encompassed except if some other ones occur in the course of the question all the situations that can lead to janaba with respect to men any instance of seminal discharge that is connected with feeling of arousal will make guslu compulsory except if it is just some accidental thing that is as a result of disorder in the functioning of the body system maybe anxiety extreme cold or accident or things like that and uh, a man just discovers that something is there but which is not in any way connected with feeling of sensuality that will not warrant janaba it will only require him cleaning up himself of all the traces of that thing and then continue with his salah with respect to our women folk i think we can only talk about two meeting of the genitals seeing the fluid in the dream or even in real life in a situation as well that is connected with arousal but as we can establish two levels of secretion or discharge in terms of men the women will be in the best position to distinguish between an interlocutory or an intermediary secretion and then the secretion that is connected with, with the peak, peak of, uh, uh, of uh, their feeling uh, in that area. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ أولى مستم النساء فلم تجدوا ما أن فتيمم صعيدا طيبا فامسحوا بوجوهكم وأيديكم إن the verse is essentially dedicated to states of impurity that will necessarily require the requisite purification before we observe our worship and we discover that the two states that are peculiar to our women folk is omitted are we there this should have been a good passage of the quran to also discuss about the need for women to abstain from salah also in their monthly monthly course or also in the state of their postpartum bleeding the omission of that in this passage as well may also raise an issue and the issue is whether or not menstrual or postpartum bleeding are in essence impurity that blood does it in fact constitute impurity or are, are women essentially in the state of impurity spiritual impurity by being in that state if we look we look through a verse in surah to baqarah I think that should be 222 of Surah 2. Allah says, Yas'alunaka anil mahid, Qul huwa adhan, fa'tazilun nisa'a fil mahid. Yas'alunaka anil mahid, Qul huwa adhan, fa'tazilun nisa'a fil mahid. 
نعم يسألونك عن المحيض قل هو أذى فاعتزلوا النساء في المحيض فاعتزلوا النساء في المحيض They will ask you the Prophet sallallahu alaihi concerning menstrual bleeding قل هو أذى If we check our translations, we may find two words being used together. Say it is a hot also and pollution. Am I there? A number of translations have added that. But linguistically speaking, if we say other, it will only mean hot. I do not know where in language other can mean uh, uh, pollution. Even if we can say that all things that are pollutants may be injurious, it is not the same to say that all things that are injurious must necessarily be pollutant, may necessarily be pollution. And this has also led to a number of issues that are, are women necessarily impure when they are in that state so that they should see themselves as someone not qualified to relate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially against the background that they are prevented from observing salah they are also prevented from fasting also prevented from observing tawaf in that state is that on account of a situation of impurity so that they are disqualified from worshipping Allah because they are spiritually considered impure that is the view at some quarter but some have also said that no because generally speaking the jurists are of the view that blood ordinarily is not an impure substance because they have said that the companions of the Prophet وسلم, used to pray in his lifetime in their various injuries. You know, it was a time of war. Many of them sustained injuries that they had to nurture sometimes for years. And they will be in their bandages that will still be, you still find blood using out from the And still they will be praying. While in the battlefield they were praying, in spite of whatever injuries they might have sustained. But some have said, yes, blood is not an impurity except menstrual and postpartum bleeding. That is considered to be najasa. And they say that it is because it is an impure thing and that that state is a state of impurity that our women are prevented from observing salah and the likes whereas uh, some have also adduced some other reasons that it could not be that and they cited a hadith where Aisha radiallahu anha was sent by the messenger of Allah to fetch for some mats in the masjid and she said that she was in her menses and the prophet replied go in and fetch the mat for your lord cannot hate you on account of what he has created with you so based on that some have said it could be for some for some reasons and that is why some scholars have insisted that except of course what we have clear established and authentic authority in the sunnah of the prophet وسلم, for as to whether or not a woman should do or not do a menses there is no need to extend that to other areas because menses per se does not in any is not in any way conclusive of a state of impurity some have suggested that there could be other reasons that condition of our women is always associated with some discomfort, inconveniences. Some women don't find it funny at all. And that's a monthly experience for them. They must suffer fever. They must suffer headache. Some would have to be having serious pain so that they will be rolling on the floor. There are people who must be out of work or out of school for at least two days on monthly basis. 
and that has also been recognized allah is a merciful god very compassionate god a woman cannot be going through such and allah will still insist that she still has to pray to time five times a day because even if some women are lucky that they don't have this condition if that appears to be the situation of the average women then it will only be rational that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should make that the general rule so that those of them who will go through the condition and come out of it without any feeling will only see themselves as lucky i mean for the period that the obligation of salah will be off them aside from that we also know that um, it could also be a factor that uh, if a woman is bleeding there is a very high tendency that substantial blood would have been lost that can also put her health into some risk at that area at that time so if the the rate of release of the blood is so excessive compared to the rate of replacement of the blood through whatever a woman may be taking or eating you know we eat as well to replenish the lost blood while a woman is in sujood and she would also have to lean on the floor to rise up from the state from that posture of sujood there will definitely be some contraction exerted on the abdominal uh, tissue are we there you cannot lean on the floor and to rise up without contrasting your abdomen if that will also have some secondary implication on the womb and that will also result to excessive that is that and we don't have a corresponding replacement that may be some even if you like call it a remote cause for condition of hemorrhage it can lead to dizziness i don't know whether you have observed i mean even women if for any reason you have failed to observe your salatul asr in within the first three days of ramadan before the body gets adjusted to it and you are observing asr at 5 5 30 pm so late in the day when you have no uh, enough food in your system do you observe that if you rise from sujood to standing what do you experience in your eyes huh? sometimes one may experience some dizziness if care is not taken some may fall on account of that we are talking of men who has only abstained from eating for some substantial hours not to talk of women now who is even bleeding in the process they may some have suggested that regular solar especially if it will also even involve nawafil may even though for the blood to come out has its own advantage as well because it gives women comfort as well but as well it shouldn't they shouldn't be subjected to a condition that will make it too uh, excessive or maybe to avoid dizziness or whatever or on account of the pain they go through or something like that some have observed that that is the reason it is not because the blood or that state has necessarily rendered them impure the same thing will explain why they should not fast somebody that is bleeding should rather be eating well that is the time she should be uh, uh, eating food eating that is food even high in high ion, ion that ion, will that reach be rich in, uh, in hemoglobin so that whatever blood that he has she has uh, lost will be replenished that should not be the time that we should say a woman should not fast so our women are not fasting not because they are unholy and allah hates them temporarily for the time being but because it is injurious for them to uh, observe fast the same thing will explain why tawaf may also not be observed because that is even more strenuous it involves a lot of uh, a physical activity which will also require a lot of energy if we have put out all this then it will mean that on the strength of surah 2 verse 222 what is only a prohibited against uh, women in that state 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said who are other fa'tazilu nisa'a fil mahidi wa la taqrabu wa la taqrabu hunna hatta yatuhun fa iza tatahharuna fa'tuhunna min haithu amarakumullah inna allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbul mutatahirin Allah Azza wa Jalla in that state as uh, forbidding men from approaching their women in that state until they are clean of the the situation they are and that is because it is other we would leave that to our medical experts to tell us how injurious it may be for spouses to be meeting in that condition except that the addition and pollution or an impurity that is added by a number of translators may not necessarily be founded in the original word of the quran so if this is the position that we think is established then nothing should prevent a woman from doing any act of ibadah in a state of menses except the ones that are established which are salah uh, fasting and tawaf nothing should prevent her from having her askar reciting her quran uh, reading books of tafsir if she's a teacher she can teach if she's a learner of the quran she can learn and as against the junub which may not be allowed admittance into the masjid nothing also prevents a woman from being present in the masjid provided she can properly take care of herself so that her state will not constitute some uh, irritation to other mosque users. users that is the that only is thing that may concern us, us. Other, other, why, other, other than, than that, that, that there is nothing that is preventing a woman from being in the masjid if this tafsir were to be in the masjid okay i think someone asked at the beginning of ramadan that a woman who has envisaged that her period will come during the period of ritika should she bother to go at all or when itikaf okay let me just leave it at that I think the best is that uh, she should come and she should remain in Iltikaf provided that she gets herself properly engaging in all other activities that may be spiritual except she cannot join in Salah. That is the only one that is applicable to here. But don't uh, take what I have seen as the only view that is available. Uh, you may read some other references and some may also have, have expressed some other views as well that their views are also recognized but with due respect to them this is what we are very sure and certain that we have authorities that are established in support of them any other thing that may be said in this regard will be a matter of inference uh, and a matter of opinion and people are free to express their opinions while others also are free to differ so that's on that i think we have taken care of all states of guslu any other situation that will warrant guslu i think it's only janaza when the time comes huh? and uh, maybe someone entering into islam newly i mean situations that will make ritual based compulsory there may be other situations that are disputed upon like friday coming in of the day friday will it also necessitate a ritual birth there is a hadith in that regard where the messenger of allah is quoted to have said that guslul jum'a wajibun ala kulli muhtalim that to observe the ritual birth of jum'a is compulsory on any muslim who has attained the age of maturity age of puberty but, but in spite of this hadith majority of the scholars except the hanabila are of the view that juma bath is something meritorious meritorious in the sense that if we do it we get rewarded and if we don't then we may not be punished in spite of that hadith and uh, some had looked beyond the text of the hadith 
to the circumstantial uh, uh, so, uh, so the conditions that surrounded the Prophet Sallallahu saying that. And um, they were of the view that Medina was the center where Juma prayer was being observed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and which would also receive worshippers from villages around the city who would have to converge in the mosque of the prophet for juma prayer on weekly basis and that would also necessitate you know villagers they are always the same in the ancient time and now villagers are less civilized are we there villagers don't care a lot for their personal hygiene and usually on fridays there used to be some substantial discomfort or nuisance being suffered by city people eh? when the villagers would have to join them for salat al juma and that it was on the basis of that that the prophet sallallahu made juma prayer compulsory at least to address the the, uh, sorry, Juma bath compulsory to address the hygiene of the villagers who may not care to have a bath even for three weeks. They are comfortable. <laughs> Once they can eat and drink, it's not. I mean, you will not die, and they can remain there, especially if the weather is not favorable to that. And then the prophet made it compulsory, even if a Muslim will not have a bath at all. At least on friday once a week that will be something compulsory and uh, but you see islam is a very interesting faith and islamic jurisprudence as well can be very interesting you may see some jurists who would say you are simply stressing yourself what's your concern about digging deep into why the prophet had said what it is stated and it is clear Muslim Jum'a Wajibun ala kulli muhtalim Jum'a prayer is compulsory on anybody who has attained puberty final if you have not observed your Jum'a bath then you don't have a valid salat on Jum'a that is the implication in that order for those who believe it is compulsory but the overwhelming majority of Islamic jurists who have uh, taken a different position, they know better about this hadith than you. That is what we will simply tell a person who is being too uh, unnecessarily. Eh? The, the hadith that you are relying on, those who have said it's not compulsory and are meritorious, they know better about that hadith. They can better interpret it. The hadith is not hidden from them. They have seen the hadith and they have also expressed the, 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 this opinion. That is because they know what you do not know. And they have seen what you are unable to see. So that's why your own view is being narrow and parochial. And they are being able to express a broader view because they have seen beyond that only hadith. So, so. I think we can move on from the case of Guslu now. I want to take advantage of the passage to address all other unnecessary auxiliary matters. And then we can move on to Wa'inkuntum Marda Aw Ala Safar. أو لامستم النساء فلم تجدوا ماء فتيمموا فتيمموا صعيدا طيبا فامسحوا بوجوهكم وأيديكم إن الله كان عفوا غفورا وإن كنتم مرضى and if you are sick sick but at the same time in the state of Janaba sick and at the same time uh, has just gone out of the menstrual or postpartum bleeding or one has even gone to the toilet here uh, urination is not mentioned and we all know that uh, the Quran and the Sunnah will always work together I do not know any verse of the Quran that has uh, depicted uh, urination as a factor 
that can render a believer uh, uh, I will say spiritually unclean to observe salah except of course we have to supply that from where Huh? Huh? from the hadith of the prophet so i'm, I'm right now you know filling that gap based on the hadith i had quoted earlier and there is no water or one is even on a journey is a traveler and the condition is such that there was no water available or even there was no water available and in that case he cannot either observe wudu or observe gusu and that is also a good situation where a believer can explore an option in a tayammu. Sickness of any sort. Sickness of any sort. Especially a sickness that is not consistent with the use of water. There was uh, a companion in the time of the Prophet and that was one of the instances where the messenger of Allah was very angry and uh, the hadith will also teach us some lessons those of us who like to take hardline positions on religious matter uh, a companion who sustained a serious injury in one of the battles and possibly the wound could also uh, have suffered some infection that were so serious found ourselves in the state of Janaba. Rather than ask the Prophet Sallam, you know there are several muftis around too. Eh? So he just asked some few people around and uh, some unauthorized mufti or uncertified mufti gave him a fatwa that ha Janaba if it were something else yeah, then we could have uh, suggested that I am more. But this one my brother you don't have an option you just have to observe birth and the companion also innocently heeded the advice in spite of his condition he poured water on his body so that he can continue to observe his salah and that further led to serious complication of his condition and so unfortunately some acute feverish condition developed and uh, on account of that the ummah lost that companion he died because he had the back and the news got to the prophet and the prophet replied that's an unusual reaction from the messenger of allah and they killed him let me leave the other side of it and the prophet seriously talked very hard on people who would give fatwa without knowing they should have asked they should have asked and the prophet gave several other options you know it would have been sufficient for him to just wipe the bandage or whatever is covering his uh, body with water even if he would have to but depending on the extent that you can avoid a place a part of the body which uh, uh, allowing that part to come in contact and what kind of water would they even be using at that age definitely untreated water eh? that would definitely also have all sorts of microorganism and things like that and the prophet sallam blamed and corrected them and in that case even a tayammu would also have been perfectly uh, appropriate tayammu is a perfect substitute not only for wudu but also as well for guslu if one is having serious cold that may aggravate your condition and you cannot find the hot water around or you just feel uh, so allergic to water at a particular time please is not compulsory just get a particle of sand and observe your tayammum and your prayer will be valid even if one is in the state of janaba he can as well observe tayammum to pray till the time he will find the use of water convenient or we are on a journey or one of you has just returned from the physics uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. the last time okay let's go into a little bit of uh, rhetoric here the last time we talked about salat representing what eh? 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 representing what okay here you see allah as well saying or any of you has just returned from physics 
Have you gone to visit faces to say salam alaikum to visit? No. That will mean what? I've just returned from where? Toilet. Because the main activity of the toilet is that that thing is being discharged there. So that is the lack of. Okay, let's put that aside. And you are just returning from the toilet, meaning that you would have to observe what ablution. But we know as well that coming from the toilet is also of two stages. Hmm? Once anything has come out of that in us, then ablution will be compulsory. It could be the solid one and it could also be the gaseous one. Are we there? So if you pass wind or you break wind as it's so called, that is also what? A gaseous a gaseous what pieces so that will also warrant uh wudu and that gap is also filled on the strength of the sunnah of the prophet wasallam. and i say urine also comes in the same category um, 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 and we have talked about that alongside with the first part of the verse Sa'idan tayyiba. Then in that case, you are free to observe tayammum with a clean sa'id. Sa'id can be anything that is part of the art, whether on the surface or at a little depth below the surface. Once it is part and parcel of the soil of the art, then we can observe tayammum with it. How do we observe tayammum? Famsahu bi wujuhikum wa aydikum. We simply touch the earth or the soil or whatever particle that is part of the earth that we may want to use, and then we rub by it our faces and our hands. Inna Allah kana afuwan. Ghafura. For verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is full of pardon and is also a forgiving God. Now, there are also issues here. Number one, walam tajidu ma'an. That is different from walam walam uh, tajidu ma'an is different from maybe for example walam yujad ma'un aw walam yarid ma'un is a different expression that you as an individual cannot find water what will make tayammum permissible is not lack of water per se but your own inability to access water are we there in your ordinary situation and in your ordinary circumstance that even if you may have to make an effort that effort must not be an effort that is going to impose an unusual difficulty on you are we together the test is a subjective test relative to the person who wants to wash it not an objective test relative to the availability or otherwise of water are we together it is difficult to say there is no water in existence you may not have your neighbor may have some other people around you may have but you don't owe it a duty to I go and knock people's houses at odd hours why and uh, i'm sorry uh, there is no water in my house and i've just gone to the toilet i need to observe salah can i please have some some water there that is uh, introducing a mashapka that is beyond the ordinary once you as an individual cannot access water in your ordinary your regular situation and circumstance then you have the privilege to observe diamond if you will now have to go extra mile for example to travel from here to say jack on day 
Why? Why? Because there because is no water, water in the masjid, the masjid and in the entirety of this street, for example, example, there is no water. The only way water, water can be available is to go some kilometers away. That may only be a stress to earn extra reward from Allah. Get me right. A stress to earn what? Extra reward from Allah. But it is not a stress that is required to meet an obligation. Once you cannot find water, you have a license to approach the earth, observe tayammum, and then continue with your salah. If you now have water afterwards, the prayers that you have observed remains valid. You owe no duty to re-observe them in any way. Because tayammum is a perfect substitute for wudu and guslu. Once one has performed it in the right circumstance. May I also add here that those of us having people or having cause to nurture or take care of sick people who may be having difficulty performing ablution. One of such preparations that Muslims must be making for their sick ones is to get a tray that will have some particle of sand close to their bed because we have to encourage our sick to pray under whatever condition. Once they still have their consciousness, once they are conscious, let us encourage them to pray. At that time, their iman will decline. You see, uh, physical illness may also have a direct bearing on also spiritual illness. Are we there? If one is not hell and hearty physically, his iman may also suffer substantial decline. So it is the responsibility of those of us that are around to encourage such people to observe their prayer in that circumstance and then make sand available for them to just touch, rub their face and hand and also observe their salah in whatever condition they find themselves. Tayammum is observed by rubbing the face and rubbing the hands to wear. To wear to the wrist. Part of the common errors is that people take tayammum to the elbow. Another common error, which is also founded in the hadith, but the hadith is weak, is to also observe tayammum with two strikes of, 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 of the art or the particle we want to use. What is rather authentic is that one strike is enough, and then you rub your face with it, and then your hand to the um, wrist. Another thing, Another thing that must that be must talked be about, about is that, 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 that tayammum does not have a lifespan. Your tayammum puts you in a state of spiritual purity till any factor has also occurred that can vitiate your ablution. If you have not urinated, you have not defecated, you have not done anything that can put you into the state of Janaba, or you are a woman, you have also not... Uh, okay, let's leave that. Uh, you, you will be having your tayammum intact and then you can also observe your prayer it is not required to say any nawaitu at the beginning of neither tayammum nor wudu nor guslu the sunnah is to say bismillah at the commencement of the act of purification your intention is in your heart and you don't have to connect your uh, tayammum with mentioning by mentioning the name of any particular salah all these are innovations in connection with tayammum as it were inna Allah kana afuwan ghafura Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this option because is full of pardon and is also a forgiving God. Uh, inshallah, we'll be uh, stopping here and from there we'll be proceeding to tomorrow. May Allah spare our lives till then and beyond.